Yeah, he's fun, but he can't Jesus, because yes, indeed, only you are holy. We thank you for the privilege that you've given us through your son, Jesus. And the power of your Holy Spirit to be holy even as you are holy. We thank you for your finished work tonight. It is done. It is completed. It is perfected. We embrace it. We thank you for it. We bless your name in and through it. We thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit to make it real in our lives. Thank you, Father God. We bless you for this final day of teaching in these 21 days. You have kept us. You have blessed us. You have taught us. You have led us. You have guided us. You have shown your face to us. You have transformed us. You have changed us. And we remain and abide changed as a result of your glory. Thank you for your goodness. We bless you now. We praise you, Lord God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please take your seats. Praise God. Hallelujah. As we said earlier, we're going to spend a little time in praying tonight. So please indulge us in that. And uh, <clears throat> let me just go ahead and cover uh, a little bit in chapter 19 of Gospel of John, chapter 20, Gospel of John, and then we're going to take a little intermission in worship, uh, pray, take one prayer, and we'll we, we, we see where we are, and then if God willing, we go to John chapter 16 and 17. But we just, we're just going to play by the air. We're just going to let the Holy Spirit lead us. Amen? John chapter 19. Let me just cover a couple of things there, and then I'm going to flow into John chapter 20. <clears throat> John 19 verse 29. Well, actually, we can start from verse 28. John 19, 28. And from John chapter 18... Flowing through chapter 19, it describes the crucifixion. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Again, there was never a time in all of this period that Jesus lost control of his faculties. He was acutely aware all through his passion of all the scriptures that needed to be fulfilled so that the word of God will come to pass. So now things are happening. Things are happening. It's on the cross already. And the Bible tells us all things were now accomplished. And I remember, oh yes, there's one more thing. You know, there's one more thing. I, I need to take vinegar. So I thirst. I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on his up, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up the his spirit. They didn't take it from him. This was a script from the beginning to the end between his Father, himself, and Holy Spirit. And I continue to emphasize this for you and I because you need to know the one with whom we have to deal is in total, absolute, complete control of the universe and of you and I. It's in control. It's in control. He set up the stage. If he did not tell them he first that they won't give him the vinegar. But because he knew what needed to happen, he told them, he thirst, 
They bring it to him. He drinks it. He now, yes, all the scriptures, check, 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 check. Everything is, is, is done. And having said that, the Bible said, he said, it is finished. And then on his own volition, he gave up the spirit. Nobody takes it away from him. Now, let's just jump a little bit here. Verse 38. There's so much. We, we can spend a lot of time on almost every verse. Okay, but let's get on to John, John uh, 19, verse 38. After this, Joseph of Amirathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, hmm, secret disciples. Why? For fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who had first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes and about a hundred pounds. Okay? Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with the spices as the custom of the Jews is to bury. So now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had been laid yet. So there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation, preparation day for the tomb was nearby. Chapter 20, verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Let's just stop there for a minute. In that verse 40 of John 19, we are told that the body of Jesus, after he had been crucified, was bound in linen by Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus and prepared him for burial. I think it is important for us to understand what is taking place here uh, because that will help us appreciate not only what Jesus did but what's about to happen in John chapter 20. It was not just coincidental that they wound his body in linen. If you are to read in Leviticus chapter 16, you find a very vivid and detailed account of the holiest day in all of Israel. It is a day called the day of the great atonement. This one day in Israel is supposedly, based on what we know from scripture and even tradition, is the holiest day of all the days in any given year. Why is that so? And I'm giving a little background here because it will set up the stage to understand what Jesus was doing here. You see, under the law, God made provision for the sins of all the Israelites, for every sin or every category of transgression, there were certain animal sacrifices they must offer. So, for example, if I told a lie, there was a sacrifice for that. If I stole your donkey, there was a sacrifice for that. Uh, any transgression covered. However, the Israelites also knew there were sins that happened sins of omission that you may not even know about. So on a daily basis, the individuals took care of whatever sins they knew or thought they had committed. So today's what? Today's Friday, so you sin today, you offer a turtle dove. Uh, tomorrow, you do another sin, maybe a, a lamb, whatever. But once a year, God said, you know what? I know you've taken care of individual sins that you are aware of. But we don't want to take any chances. So once a year, on top of what you've done on your own, there must be a corporate cleansing of taking care of the sins of the entire Israelites once a year. After which, on that one day, the entire Israel grabs, ah, thank God. 
and then they do it in the next year, and the next year. That's in Leviticus 16. But the point I need to make here is, you see, on this one day, the high priest, who ordinarily was robed or dressed in colorful vestures, colorful, almost like what the Pope will wear, and all those great bishops. We don't have any of them here, uh, but maybe one of these days, one of you guys, IBK, uh, we don't know when you're going to buy your, your vesture. But anyway, colorful things that these guys will normally wear on a day-to-day -day basis. But on this one day, on the great day of atonement, he was disrobed completely, and the only thing he had on was linen. Just for one day. All the other days, he had his regular garments, colorful, bright, beautiful, all of them very symbolic. But on this one day, because on this day, this is the only day of the year that he will ever enter into the most holy place, the third room in the tabernacle or in the temple where the Ark of the Covenant rests. He only saw it once a year and only on the day of atonement. And he did not dare go in the place wearing anything else or without blood. Did you understand that so far? Okay. So all of Israel knew that this is one day when the priest, the high priest rather, went into the presence of God in the behalf of all of Israel. Now, he just didn't dare go, in, go there without blood. On this day in Leviticus chapter 16, two unblemished goats were set aside. And the priest will bring the goats before the altar. And then they will cast a lot, like roll the dice. And one of those goats will be picked. They will call it the goat for the Lord. And the other one they will call a scapegoat, or it literally terms a scapegoat. Both of them together constituted the sin of him. You see, what Jesus was to come to do was to, there was not any one animal or any one sacrifice in and of itself that could, show, that could picture it to us. So in God's wisdom, way back in Leviticus, he said there must be two goats. The first goat, the priest will take it to the altar kill it. Take the blood, sprinkle the furniture in the temple or a tabernacle, come back out, and then for the goat, for the second goat, the scapegoat, which, by the way, the literal meaning of the word scapegoat is escape. Don't forget that. The scapegoat or the escape goat must be kept alive. That one didn't die. One died, the other didn't. Okay. The one that did not die, the priest would tie red wool on its horns and then cut part of that red wool and tie it on the doorknob of the temple. After the one that's been slaughtered has been slaughtered, they had a designated priest who will now lead this goat that is alive. 10 to 12 miles onto the outside of the city and let it go. Oh, before he did that, he confesses the sins of all Israel over the scapegoat and then sends it away and is never seen again in Israel. See that? Now, tradition says, this is not in the Bible, that at the point where the goat is escaped into the wilderness. Remember the red wool that was tied on the knob of the door? It miraculously turns white. And that was the signal to all of Israel that the great day of atonement is being accepted. It was a sort of relief for them to watch that red wool turn white. Just as it is for those who follow Rome. 
when a pope dies and they finally get a new pope, what happens? Smoke. Why smoke? <laughs> Charles Dickey must know that because he's a Vatican representative. <laughs> So the message is to everybody. Let you know everything is fine. Incidentally, about the time that Jesus was being crucified, that miracle stopped happening in Israel. Why? Because the real lamb is not here. Now, the reason this is so important, this is so important, what I just shared with you is so important. We hear about the death of the Lord Jesus, his burial, and the resurrection, and we just wonder, what, 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 why, why do we have to have things like this? Why did it have to happen like that? The point is, if it's not alive, if in fact Jesus did not rise from the dead, then our sins are not taken care of permanently. They are not forgiven. They may have been forgiven for a minute, but it's not, for, it's not forever. And so God used that live goat to tell Israel, because the goat is alive. The ability of the goat to carry and bear your sins, it still remains. Although we know it's a goat, a goat will die in time. But Jesus now, the true Lamb of God, not only came, bore our sins, died, was buried, and then he got, it, got out of the grave. No other faith promises you that. No way. Mohammed died and is still rotten in the grave. Buddha, Confucius, all of them. So I want you to know, you and I are part of a rich, true, living tradition. This is not just something of the figment of man's imagination. This is real. This is real. Now, let me read a little bit and then, I, oh man, I know where I'm going, so it's, it's, it's so difficult. Okay. John 20 verse 2 now. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter. I'm going to come back to Leviticus, Leviticus 16 in a minute, but let me just read a few more verses so you can, it will make sense. And to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb. And we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together. And the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. Tradition says this was John. Okay. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying there. Yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen clothes lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded together in a place by itself. Unbelievable. First of all, to the Pharisees and the elders and the scribes, who will want to have a conspiracy and lie, and say somebody stole his body. This is their problem. This, because if somebody was going to steal, steal the body, there's no way they're going to steal the body and leave the linen cloth in there. Not only that, we are told that there was a, the head was neatly together in one place and the body was separated from that. They are signifying to you and I that the work of the head is finished, finished. Jesus said, foxes have holes. The birds of the air have nests. He said, the son of man, though, has no place to lay his head. He said, it's already done. It's there, neat. But the body that God is preparing for him. You and I are the body that's been prepared. So he's saying, the head's job is done. It's finished. But I need my body to join me. I need my body to join me. That's what God is doing right now. He's building us as that part of the body of Christ who will be connected to him and together shake the world and present to God 
a glorious bride without spot or without wrinkle. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also and saw and he believed. For as yet they did not know this scripture that they must rise again from the dead. Now that, that really, I don't understand how they, how they could not know that he's going to rise from the dead. He told them God knows how many times. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary. Say Mary. Mary. Say Mary. Mary. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. There's something about this Mary. Mary. If you read in Luke chapter 23, and I'm verse 55, first of all, you need to understand something about this Mary. This is Mary Magdalene, of whom Jesus cast out seven devils, we are told, huh? But that's just by the way. Because now, this Mary is totally reformed, transformed. is a totally different person. So different, we are told in Luke 23, verse 25, she, she will not miss a thing. She stood there at that cross. Watch the whole process. And then when, she, when they were done, as they transferred him to the tomb, she watched them. She was observing Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, watching what they are doing. What are they going to do with my Lord? But not only that, the next morning, the Sunday morning, she went there. For, she was the last at the cross and first at the tomb. Something was happening to this Mary, my friend. Last one to leave the cross and first one to be at the tomb. My friend, it's not how, many, how much teaching you get. It's not how many seminars you go. It's not how well you pray. It's not how well you praise. But the throbbing the love of God that's inside of you, Amen. that's motivating Amen. you, that's driving you, Amen. that's speaking to you. You just can't get enough of him. Where were the disciples? The ones he's been teaching for three and a half years. The soldiers showed up in the garden, they were gone. But Mary Magdalene received something from Jesus and that thing changed her. My prayer tonight that the Lord God will touch us in a way that will leave us permanently touched in the name of Jesus. That the touch of God will remain and abide upon us that we will never ever return to our own vomit. Permanent work done in this woman. Last at the cross, first at the tomb. But not only that, she got to the tomb, saw that it was empty, went and told the disciples. They came there, saw it, left, she remained. She remained. Nobody is going to tell her the story of what happened to her God. She wants to find out what happened. Where is he? I saw him crucified. I saw him placed in the tomb. Now he's not here. What happened? But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. And she wept. And, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in the white sitting. One at the head and the other at the feet. Where the body of Jesus had lain. Now, this is the reason for which I went to Leviticus chapter 16. This blew me away when I saw this. In the account of Matthew, in chapter 26 of Matthew, the Bible said when Jesus was crucified, the veil in the temple was rent from the top to the bottom. That veil was what covered the most holy place and the Ark of the Covenant from the common people's view. To see the Ark of the Covenant was a very special privilege reserved only for the high priest and that only once a year. Only once a year they could see it on the Day of Atonement and that's just the high priest alone, the most high priest. In fact, it was so 
sacred that tradition tells us because nobody could ever go into that place. If the man was to die while he was offering sacrifice, they can't, go, they can't get him. They have to use the rope to pull him out. So understand the Jewish mind. Who understands how sacred that most holy place is? How sacred the ark is? And now, picture in your mind's eyes the priest at Passover doing all their sacrifices, doing all their work, and all of a sudden as Jesus was hanging on the cross, the vent rains from top to bottom, burned. And all of the sacredness that they have guarded for 400 years became exposed to public view. Wow. Everybody can see in there what had been an exclusive thing now become inclusive. So now in John 20, Mary didn't move. She didn't go anywhere. She was so curious. What happened to my God? And she took the peep and entered into the tomb. And for some reason this time, she sees two angels sitting. Please, can I have my designated angels? You sit over here. You sit over here. First one on the other side. Thank you. One on the head, one on the bottom. And in between them had to be a lay a flat S surface, surface. Yes. where the Lord had lain. Yes. Picture in your mind's eyes. Because to lay a dead body that has been blooded and battered and bruised on a flat surface yes. for three days will have meant some drips of the blood remain on the surface. Yes. So all of a sudden, God was intending to show Mary, this curious Mary, this lovesick Mary, who came to the tomb and in this very private enclosure finds two angels and a blood-stained surface, symbolically speaking of, to us and to her of the Ark of the Covenant. And if you know anything about the Ark of the Covenant in Exodus 22, the Bible, no, Exodus 25, verse 22, the Bible says, between the angels are the Ark of the Covenant on the mercy seat. From there, I will commune with you. I will not talk to you anywhere else, Israel, except right there at the mercy seat. What makes this a mercy seat? Because in the real Ark of the Covenant, Yes, there must be blood stain on the ark. So yes. Jesus' blood now for sure is on the surface. Yes. And the blood stained mercy seat covered the laws that condemned all of Israel. Oh. So God brings Mary in and she walks in and sees these two angels right there where Jesus had lain. Please, why are you taking your seat? Hold, don't, don't leave, don't leave. Let me just read what happens. Verse 13. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away, notice what she said, My Lord. Personal pronoun. I don't know about you guys, but my Lord. My Lord. My Lord. I'm here looking for my Lord. my Lord. Not your Lord, my own Lord. Yes. My own personal Lord. Lord. They have taken him away. What happened to my Lord? And I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Notice, when she saw this Ark of the Covenant scene, the angels spoke to her. Woman, why are you weeping? She told them why she was weeping, but notice the focus of her attention. Wow. If anybody in this room saw an angel, oh my goodness. you will sit down at the angel's feet. <laughs> yes. You will engage the angel, talk to the angel, write a book about angels, sing a song about angel, but not Mary. The object
object of her affection was not angels. Like Moses of Exodus 33, God said, Moses, I will send angels to go with you to the promise. Moses said, good deal, but not good. Thank God for the angels, but I want something bigger and greater. If your presence don't go with us, I don't want to go with angels. Here, this woman had the opportunity to talk to angels. Why are you weeping? I'm looking for my Lord and she turns around. Because listen, you guys don't have an answer. A dead Jesus is bigger than living angels. So I'm not concerned about you angels, your angelic beings, your might, your strength, your power, the swiftness of your movement. No, that does not impress me. Give me my Jesus. The one who paid the price for my sins. The one who died for me. The one who's alive for my victory. That's the one I want to behold. Not angels. Because for you angels, I have something bigger than you. You at best, you have been sent to be ministers to me. Who is the heir of salvation? Even what God has done for us, angels, you don't know it. You are looking and trying to, God, why, why do you like them so much? But the important point here is this. Just as God promised Moses in Exodus 25 that at this mercy seat, <laughs> wherever I find the blood and I find my love and my mercy, where they kiss and meet, there I will speak to you. Amen. Amen. So since she came to the mercy seat, Jesus had to show up. She talked to the angels and told her, and I said, you guys, you, you have no clue. I know you are here. Yes, this is Moses, but I'm looking for something bigger, bigger, greater, more mighty than you guys. And she turned around. Turning around, indicating her resolution not to deal with angels. Now, understand angels, nothing, nothing wrong with angels. God sends them to minister to us, to help us. So I'm not telling you angels are not important or significant. But in light of Jesus, and compared to God, nah. they are nothing. nothing. At best, they are servants. Yes. And we must understand that. Yes. Mary, where did you learn this from? Wow. You are not in the upper room seminar. You are not in Mount Olive seminar. Where did you learn it from? This is what I'm trying to tell you guys, folks. We need to press into know God. Amen. Because your Holy Ghost will teach you that men cannot teach you. Yes. Yes. Who taught Joseph to say no to sin? Nobody. Which terminal did he go? To know that this is a no-go area. Yes. I keep on telling you guys, we can't keep on play, paying clergy to do your homework for you. You need to know God for yourself. So Jesus showed up. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. <laughs> if Mary was big, let's even assume she was a big woman. Do you know what it means to call a dead weight? Because she's saying now, just show me where he is. I'll go and get him. Yes, I'll carry Mary, by yourself? I'll carry you go and carry a dead man, a dead weight? She will have the power. Ah, but she was touching something that I pray that God will quicken to us. Amen. First Corinthians 13, 7 says, Love be as all things. When you are in love, nothing is insurmountable. You can carry a mountain and put it on your head. Love will do it for you. You guys have been in love before. Some of you are still in love. Others of you, you've gone out of love. I don't know. When you get love sick, everything and anything is possible. But at first, she did not recognize him. Look at verse 16. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. 
Oh my word. Oh my word. Did Jesus not say to us in John chapter 10, I know my sheep and call them by name? He first teased her as a woman. No, she's not supposed to know that. Woman could be anybody. Anybody in the planet, woman. So she didn't respond to that. But when she heard the shepherd call the sheep by name, Mary. Ah, there's a special tune to that. My wife's name is Sharon. But when her mother calls her, she calls her Sherilyn. <laughs> Nobody else, when she hears that word, even though it does not sound like Sharon, she knew who's calling. Yes. Amen. Amen. All right. <laughs> Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yes. God wants you to know, every one of you. You, thought, you really thought your mother gave you the name. Your, on your baby dedication, you match up here. And your name shall be whatever, Isaac. And you really think your father and your mother got it together. They gave you the name. Name that had been written before you were born. And so when God needs to get your attention, he knows exactly what you say. And when you hear it, it's not the voice of a stranger. Mary. And instantly, she didn't need to see his ID. She didn't need to see his nail pierced, uh, nail pierced hand. None of that. Immediately, Rabona. She recognized him. May God call your name tonight. In the name of Jesus, may God call you out and call your destiny to be. In the name of Jesus. Your name is on his lips. You guys may be seated. Thank you very much. Now, verse 17. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. This verse 17 is part of the reason for which I read Leviticus chapter 16. You see, as the high priest in Israel was going to that most holy place to sprinkle the Ark of the Covenant with the blood of the slain goat, God specifically said, no one else must be in that tabernacle. So here it is. Jesus has risen from the dead. And like the high priest of Israel, needed to go to that most holy place to show himself to God as the Lamb of God that had been slain from before the foundation of the earth. And on this transition, here comes a woman trying to hold on to him. Even though he loves her, no doubt, he had to say to her, Mary, no, 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 not now. Not now. Don't cling to me. Don't hold me. Because we have to fulfill all righteousness. Back in the old days, nobody can stop a high priest from going to the most holy place. Why? There's an urgent business. I have to ascend to my father, present myself in the courts of heaven, satisfy the judicial requirement of the law in heaven. And then, we can fellowship you all you want. That's one aspect of it. But that's another aspect. The other aspect is this. Mary, I know you've been familiar to see me in the flesh. I walked around you guys for three years. You've known me. We've fellowship. We've laughed together. We've joked together. We've cried together. We've eaten together. I understand that. But you need to also know something, Mary. From this day forward, our relationship changes. Now you can appreciate what Paul said. I know no man after the flesh. You are still trying to hold on to me just like we did when we were eating bread and fish. But this is a new day, a new disposition. It's 
It's a new day. And because it's a new day, the relationship will have to be redefined. Yes. You've been used to seeing me, touching me in the physical realm. It's not that you will not touch me again, but it will be different, redefined relationship. So don't cling to me. I need to ascend to the Father. However, Mary, I have an assignment for you. Go to my brothers. Tell them, I'm on my way to my father and your father. My God and your God. Oh, you have no idea what God is doing here. You have no clue. I'm telling you the truth. For the rabbis, back in the day, they believe it is better to burn the words of the law than commit it to a woman. They say, listen, rather than have a word to read, the word yes. of God to read, just burn it. Yes. Than commit a woman. But Jesus here deliberately, the first commission he will make was not a rabbi, was not a priest, was not a prophet, but a woman. One at that that he had cast out seven devils. So he was eager to show them it's not your past I'm trying to establish, but your future. For those of you that are still buried in your past, I pray that God will open their understanding so you can understand it's a brand new day. To a woman. Isn't it true when the scripture said the spirit is like a wind? You don't know where it's coming from, no where it's going. The rabbis, the teachers and elders in Israel will say, Mary Magdalene, you are disqualified. God can never use you. Never. Your resume, seven devils. Ah. This one, fornication. This one, uh, th thief. This, you. Ah. Forget it. Forget it. Go and be a herbalist somewhere. Just, just forget it. Not with God. So to this woman, who of all people will have been ineligible, God says, go. But please notice the commission. Number one, go to my brethren. My brethren. Oh, there are many ways we can look, in, uh, look at that. So many ways, but I'll just, I'll just deal with one or two of them. To my brethren, Jesus' priority after that resurrection was his brethren. Now you can appreciate Romans 1.16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is the power of God on the salvation to who first? The Jews first. And then the Gentiles. New Testament scripture. So even as Jesus was raised from the dead, he was acutely aware that his first priority was his brother. Why? If the brother don't get it, who will give it to the Gentiles? If the Gentiles start coming to the church, who will establish them? They had no knowledge of God, no oracles of God. The only ones up to that time that God was dealing with were the Jews. So if you will, they were the ones that had the foundation that can help others who's coming to the church. So that's the bigger picture. But the more smaller picture was his disciples. Go tell my brethren. Go and tell them. Go and find Peter, John, Luke. All, just go. Tell them that what I told them when I was here with them, it's happened. Secondly, he said to her, my father your father. This is the first time Jesus made a reference to the Father as their Father. Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father. This is the first time he connected his Father as being their Father. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Why? Because now, the way to the holies of holies is made open. Okay. The veil has been rent. Yeah. The ark of the covenant, where the presence of the father dwells, is now available to everybody. Yes. 
So Jesus is saying, this is the reason for which I came. To reconcile God and man together. And now that I have died, I have been buried, and I have been raised from the dead, he is not just my father any longer, he is our father. Now we have realized our father, which are in heaven. Before now, it was just a teaching. Before now, it was just a theory. It was a lesson. It was a seminar. But now that he has died, buried and raised from the dead, it's reality. I'm ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. Woo! Verse 18. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Now, I really want to thank her for Mary. Not only was she sent to go to the brethren, and then of course the message that was, she was to carry, my father and your father. The first says she obeyed. She just didn't hear it and say, oh my God, I saw something today. She actually obeyed God. What would happen if you and I obey God? What would happen if we start telling people the things that God is doing, even in us, even now? She obeyed. Okay. Let's move forward here. Hallelujah. Verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. So Jesus is not playing at all with his mission. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And I know even right now, he's sending us in Jesus' name. And God will give us the grace to obey him as Mary had done. And when he has said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now, this is not saying that this man had the authority or the power to forgive sins. That only belongs to God. This is just saying that you are to proclaim forgiveness of sins as a message. Okay? I think it's very important that we understand that distinction. Now, verse 24. Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. Now, this is very, very important that we understand what's happening here. So when Jesus appeared to these disciples... And told them to receive the Holy Spirit. In fact, on that day, they became born again. The first Adam, the Bible said, was a living soul. And this last Adam, Jesus, is a quickening spirit. So when he said, receive the Holy Spirit. At that instant, now remember, his body has been dead, buried, and risen. At this point in time and history, these men received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and became born again. This is where it happened. I'm saying this because I'm about to say something else. Do you see that or you don't see it? Do I need to explain this further? Receive the Holy Spirit. This is the Holy Spirit. It's not, this is the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. <laughs> He said, receive the Holy Spirit. So, I mean, he said to, for them to receive, they received it. Yes. Or they received him, rather. Okay? Verse 24. Now Thomas called the twin. One of the twelve was not there with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the, of the nails, and my hand into his side, I will not believe. 
Okay. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Verse 27. Then he said to Thomas, Whoa. Interesting. Up above, in first verses earlier, he came in, told those men, receive the Holy Spirit. They were born again. There are 12 disciples. One was a, a devil. The many 11. Of the 11, only 10, 10 were in the room. The 10 got born again. One was outstanding. Thomas was not there. And because he had told Mary, go and tell my brother. Jesus took it upon himself. He has to find Thomas. Because it's part of the brethren that need to hear. Are you following me? Yes, yes. So here they are this time. Obviously they must have told Thomas, you missed. You were not here last week. You missed church. Ah, he was here. So now he's here seated. And Jesus entered. Amazingly, he didn't go to shake Peter's hand first. He didn't go to find John first. He went straight to, John, to, to Thomas. So Thomas, if you have not seen me and my hands, you will not believe. Please, I want you to take note of the gentle, loving rebuke. He did not say to him, you are so stupid. You are deaf. Who is your father? He didn't say that. He didn't say that. I, I, I'm praying that as we laugh and hear these things, that God will begin to do a work in us. Because all of us, at some time or the other, we have to bring correction, rebuke, and we need to learn the tenderness. It's a great tool. And we must adapt to using the tool because God gave it. Amen. But I want to tell you, it's a terrible master. And we must constantly balance the advantages of technology versus the disadvantage. Thomas missed the first meeting. It was at the second meeting. Today, my day and time, all of us have access to internet. And it is very easy for me and you to become layered and to make internet and streaming the only source of our divine information. Oh, I'm going somewhere. I say it again. Technology is good. Very good, very helpful. Serves a purpose, meets a need. But we must be careful not to misunderstand the need and uh, 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 the need that it meets. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together, they are in the midst. Not where Bank is watching internet by himself. Hebrews 10 tells us that we must be careful not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together such as some are, even as much as the days is coming nearer. Talking about today, this season, this time, this era. It is so easy. All I have to do is get home, get my iPad, www.da-da-da-da-da. Grace on Enterprise Ministries. I'm watching Grace. Hallelujah. It serves a need and a purpose if I'm sick. It serves a need and a purpose if I'm uh, ill-disposed. Something happens, I cannot be among the saints. It's good. And please hear what I'm saying. But if I make that a regular staple and disconnect myself from the body of Christ because of the convenience of the internet, I've missed God. Amen. Big 
time. Say big time. Big time. Well said. God never intended for technology to displace his body. Because when we come together, there's a dynamics. There's, there, there's rubbing together. We are the deep course upon the deep. You bring your gift, I bring my gift. And together as the deep course upon the deep, we minister to one another. I can't do that alone. No matter how powerful the picture is on the internet. No matter how excitable I am. I can only give high five to the world. I can't give it to you. I cannot create the atmosphere of glory in which God manifests himself because I'm alone. I just showed you the ark. It took two angels. Not one. Because the angels had to look at one another and, hey, man, this is great. Hallelujah. Glory be to God in the highest. Yeah, Jehovah is great and mighty. They're talking back and forth to one another and create an atmosphere in which God can land. Yes. So Thomas missed church the first week. But thank God for Thomas, he didn't miss it the second week. Amen. And because he showed up, guess what happened? Jesus showed up. showed up. Notice this. Jesus did not go to his house to find him. Jesus did not say, Thomas, I'll, I'll show up to you on the internet. No. Because there's a purpose for which these things should come together. One bring a hymn, a psalm, a prayer, an exhortation. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Hallelujah. Now, remember what I said. Technology serves its purpose. If I'm ill-disposed, I am sick. I don't have a car. There are any number of reasons for which we can use that. And we should. I'm just saying we need to be careful not to make that a regular staple. The only means that we're using for fellowship. Amen? We need to be plugged in. We need to be engaged. We need to be involved so that the gifts that God has placed within us can serve the greater body, so that the body of Christ can grow together into all things, even unto himself. Now, to show you how powerful this is, and how appreciative I am of Jesus, in verse 25, <laughs> Let me read it one more time. It's so funny. The other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. So he said, unless I see his hands and the print of the nails and put my finger in the print of the nails and put my hand on, into his side, I will not believe. Now, when it was saying that, was Jesus there? But when Jehovah showed up, straight away, he addressed Thomas's question. Straight and unbelief. What's the message? Everything you say, God hears. Everything you do in the secrecy of your home, it sees. Oh, there's some young people here tonight, but I want to say some things. Even as you're communing, husband and wife, he's watching it. Ah. Do you want me to prove that to you? You see, this, 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 these guys are so funny. You guys are looking at me as if you, you, don't, you have no idea what, what I'm talking about. Your mysterious human beings, you just appeared on the planet. I don't understand these people, Charles. The Bible in Genesis, Onan was given a woman. And the Bible says he spilled the seed. And God killed him for it. How did God know he spilled the seed? Did somebody write the letter to heaven and say, this owner is a bad man. God, I mean, he, he, he was getting with this man. He spilled the seed. Did God need anybody to tell him that? No. no. To help you know that even to your bedroom, God is seeing what's happening. Yes. Amen. When you abuse your wife. Or you abuse your husband. Yes. Take advantage of one another. Yes. Selfish Lifestyle yes. is aware of all of it. Yes. 
Nothing, nothing. It, Abba, look at what he said to Paul. Paul in Acts chapter 9 took letters on his way to Damascus, persecuted the church, put them in prison. Jesus accosted him on the way. Paul, Paul, why did I persecute me? Took it personal. So I just want us to be aware that we are not dealing with a God that's so far removed from the reality of where we are. Amen. He hears it all and sees it all. And when we have a, an awareness of that, it can help guide the things we say, how we say it, and what we say. The last point I want to make, and then we're going to go into prayer. Thomas, in this group, was the last one to be born again of them. What do I mean by that? Verse 24, they see the Holy Spirit. Bang. The time was born again. Is that not correct? So for him, he took a second meeting the next week to see Jesus and say, my Lord and my God. And at that point, he himself came to the kingdom. Okay. What's the point I want to make? Folks, it is not how long you've been born again that matters to God. I'm about to make a point. Not only is it not how long you'll be born again, it is not even under what circumstances you are born again that matters. For those 10, they met Jesus one time, they got it. For Thomas, he had an, there was an issue of unbelief there. So his circumstance or his testimony would not be like the others. He came late, he struggled, but yet he got it. Yes. Do you not know that Thomas, even though he had that record, we call, we, to, to, to do they will label him doubting Thomas. Yes. If there's anybody that doubts, what do they call him? Doubting Thomas. Yes. 2,000 years later, doubting Thomas. That guy, from that day, when Jesus touched him, till today, he became the apostle of the Lamb to India. And as we speak, there were churches and works that started as a result of his ministry that's still standing. Think about that. So he started kind of halting. You know what I mean? Just barely got started. Limping started. Unbelieving start, but he started. So the point being is not how you start. But what you do with what you have is not when you get born again or what the circumstance was when you got born again, but what you did with the gift that God gave you. And in closing this segment tonight, I just want to encourage us from Romans 8.34. The Bible says very clearly that Jesus lives to make intercession for us. What do you think he's praying about? First of all, maybe before I ask that question, I should ask another one. Does God answer Jesus' prayer? <laughs> Does God answer the prayer of Jesus? Oh, really? Okay, so if, if he's alive, and the Bible says he's making intercession for us, why do you think you're going to fail? Um, uh, do you believe anything? The man's purpose for being alive. He who says he ever lives to make intercession for What do you think he's praying? Can he possibly be prayed that, oh God, those guys should not succeed? No way. Are you sure? Why would you? I'm, I'm just wondering. <laughs> so if he's not praying that, he must be praying a prayer that's in accordance with the work he has yes. done. Yes, yes, yes. If we don't believe anything else, can we not believe that God answered Jesus' prayer? And if Jesus is praying for me and you, can we just agree? Say, God, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm agreeing with Jesus' prayer. Yes. yes. Of course. Yes. Yes. Would that not be a, a good place to start? Yes. Absolutely. I'm trying to say to us, if Thomas could limp and God delivered him from his limp, 
of unbelief and used him to the point he's used. If Apostle Paul, who was the least and the last of the apostles, came in late, persecuting and wasting away the church, and Jesus confronted him on the way to Damascus and said, Paul, how long are you going to do this for? This is not the reason for your creation. I created you for higher, better, bigger things. You are better than this. And the man got a hold of the message and turned the world right side up. How many more examples do we need? God is on your side. Amen. He is for you, not against you. Amen. He loves you dearly. He paid the price in full for your redemption. Amen? So I just want us to take to stand and let's just worship for a few minutes here and then we're going to get into prayer.